uh, this uh, two lectures, this one and the next one is going to be on the supply chain risk. Now this is a very important subject and uh, there are a lot of people who are worried about their supply chain functioning and the risks the supply chain is facing. So it is basically the supply chain risk is identifying, assessing, mitigating and managing risk is a core is the core of business behavior. So most of the businesses are now feeling the heat of supply chain risk. As uh, we have seen earlier that the ecosystem parameters, several ecosystem parameters are causes for the risk of in the supply chain and how to mitigate the risk, how to handle, how to come out of the risk uh, uh, behavior is the is, uh, is the attention of several people today. So, what is the supply chain risk? Let us define it this one. Any changes in the information, material and financial flows in the supply chain network. It can be deviation that means small changes or it can be disruption that means big changes or it can be disaster. Disaster could be that means the entire IT network or entire logistics network get get decimated and uh, due to the events in its ecosystem. In other words, the ecosystem has four parameters including the supply chain which is the resources. It can be in the institutions which are governments and social groups and also the delivery mechanisms. So the risks can come from any one of these elements anywhere in its path or its network partners or in the industry vertical or in the economic environment. So you can see the wide uh, range of factors that can affect your supply chain. So it can be the economic environment in means you know the, the crisis in, in Europe today, the financial crisis for which some countries are facing and if there is a supplier in those countries then you have a problem, the supply chain has a problem. There could be industry vertical problems in the industry vertical. For example, uh, if you have uh, say Barbie dolls, in the dolls they, there is lead in the paint uh, of the dolls, then you know all the doll vertical gets affected and similarly uh, the mad cow disease or uh, H1N1. Uh, these are the kinds of things which will affect the entire industry vertical. So basically one has to look at the all the factors that will affect your supply chain. So these changes will create what are what are, how do you feel the effect of uh, uh, any risk or any disruption deviation or a disaster. It is basically mismatch between supply and demand. So you have basically if there is a uh, there is a demand, uh, it, a demand gets affected because of some credit crunch or some other things that are happening in advanced countries. So there is more supply and there is a demand, there is a mismatch. So there are lot of lot of supply which need to be checked. But on the other hand, if there is a lot of demand and there is the there is suppliers have a problem because of some natural disasters like tsunami what happened in, in Japan, then there will be a lot of demand and the demand cannot be met because of lack of components and so on. So basically this, this will create a mismatch between the supply and demand. Second thing is it affects the supply chain functioning efficiency and output, you know in terms of uh, if there is no uh, supply of components then uh, the manufacturing uh, factories need to be vacant and people will be out of jobs and also uh, there are several other things that can happen and sometimes this can result in company closures. So if companies are not careful and if they do not mitigate the risk or try to attempt to uh, handle the risk properly, then they may 
they, 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 it may result that they have to close their companies. So, this is basically some, that's where you can see that the three flows in the supply chain, the information, material and financial flows, any of these flows are affected by a deviation, disruption or disaster from any one of the partners or any one of the, uh, this one, you can see the number of factors that can create risk in your supply chain. And this can create havoc in your supply chain. So, it is very uh, important that one studies uh, how to handle the risk, how to mitigate the risk, what are the ways in which you can you can basically handle the risk and come out of the situation. So, but I mean it is very difficult to handle uh, all the risks and it is very difficult to mitigate all the risks, but you should be able to uh, manage the risks. So, we will deal with all these factors in this. So, what is supply chain risk management? The aim of supply chain risk management is to reduce the supply chain vulnerability. The supply chain becomes vulnerable, you want to reduce the vulnerability by identification and management of risks within the supply chain and external to it in coordination with the partners. So, you are not alone in this. For example, in the recent financial crisis, there were governments trying to co cooperate with the companies to basically uh, uh, mitigate the financial risk that the companies face. So, for example, the United States government has helped a lot of auto companies and other companies to and also the financial, the banks to come out of the crisis. So, the, the, the issue is that all the supply chain partners are involved and they have to coordinate uh, to handle the risk. The first point is identification of the risk and second point is to identify what is the magnitude of the risk. A third one is you have to coordinate with other people to uh, other partners to handle the risk. So, this is it uh, if the coordination comes only after the risk has happened, this is after the fact then it may take a long time uh, to this. In the meanwhile, the disaster could occur and the supply chain breaks down. But on the other hand, if you plan about the risk management, you know, you have a list of all the possible risks, small, big and and, uh, and large. So, the, those risks and for each of them, whenever they happen, whether the probability of occurrence is large, small or whatever. And if you have ways of dealing with them and uh, written down, then and then you can plan for handling the supply chain risk. That is supply chain risk management. So, supply chain risk in an ecosystem framework, what is it? So, you have uh, risks in the global supply chain. You have risks in the global supply chain and that is therefore, as we saw in the earlier that uh, there is the supply chain, there are resources, there are the institutions and there are the delivery infrastructures and all of them can contribute to risk. We are going to see how each of them contributes to risk and what happens is the risk sources are the uncertainties that arise from ecosystem elements and impact the supply chain outcomes. So, what is the outcome of a supply chain? Outcome of supply chain is supply demand matching, efficient deliveries and you keep your uh, keep your finances uh, uh, okay and so on. So, basically whatever whatever happens in the risk sources or the or whatever uncertainties that happen, supposing the price of oil increases in the resources or the labor goes on strike. These are the kinds of uncertainties that arise in the equos in the resources. If the institutions government turned protectionist and there is a government change and so on. So, those are the kinds of risks that uh, the institutions can create. There can be 
uh, uh, disaster, the ship can sink, or there could be some problems with the with the ship, or there could be piracy that is affecting your deliveries, and so on. So these are the kinds of risks that affect the the delivery infrastructure. So basically, if you look at this, all these uncertainties that arise from the ecosystem elements and impact the supply chain outcomes, they are the risk sources. So first of all, you have to diagnose the sources. What are the sources of risk? Once you know the sources of risk, then you can map what is the effect of these risk sources. Then you can try to mitigate the risk. So first of all, you need to try to know what are the risk sources and so on. So what are the supply chain risks? We have say there's four elements. Let us uh, see um, very briefly how each one of these contribute to risk. Supposing you take the supply chain. There is the location risk. In other words, the supply chain partners are located across uh, various uh, various parts of the world, and there could be a tsunami, there could be an earthquake, there could be a thunderstorm, or there could be a war, or there could be economic crisis. And several things can happen in that location. So when the location gets over, there could be a power crisis, there could be water crisis. When any of these things affect the industry or the suppliers who are located in that uh, uh, this one. So there is the location risk that comes in. There is outsourcing risk. That is, supposing you outsource uh, a particular component to your partner, then there is the partner risk. In other words, the partner he may not he may not have he may have uh, equipment which is outdated, so he may not be able to supply modern, uh, high quality uh, uh, components, and he could probably uh, give counterfeit components. In other words, they are not of good quality, but they look alike. But they are not. This happens a lot in the pharmaceutical industry. There could be inventory deficit. There could be breach of trust. The breach of trust comes because if he is, there is an intellectual property that is involved because when you are giving uh, uh, outsource a particular component manufacturer to a company, to a supplier, then you are going to share the designs with them. Well, he can share the designs with your competitor and there could be an intellectual property theft. So I will give you examples of the of risk of these partners later where the partners have once once you outsource, then uh, the the partner there could be a breach of trust or an IP theft. If not, even if they even if it is legal, then there is a partner risk that partner takes over and you you are basically marginalized. Then design manufacturing defects, counterfeit. Inventory deficit, that is, they, they promise some inventory and because of some reasons, uh, there is the inventory deficit. The inventory deficit could come because of wrong counting, it can come because of uh, theft and other reasons. There are delays or bankruptcies of suppliers. Supposing that the supplier has a strike of his, this one, or he has uh, a bank crisis, a financial crisis, and the bank is not giving loans to him. So for whatever reasons, there could be delays on this. Sudden loss of demand due to economic downturn, company bankruptcies, and war. When war or this downturn happens, there is a lot of demand because of credit squeeze. Credit squeeze. And breakdown of machines, power, water, warehouses, and offices. These are the kinds of things that can happen from the supply chain. The second thing that is the resource related risk. One is infrastructure deficit. You don't have, say, a good ports. There could, there are no good roads and, and so on. So this becomes an infrastructure deficit and industry clusters quality quality of your structure. You have clusters all right, but they are not of high quality. And then there are labor unions who create problems. There is the credit squeeze that comes from the financial, this one, energy, water and talent shortage. So you have the, uh, the, the resources like natural resource shortage and there is talent shortage. Talent shortage is being talked about now in, in a variety of ways. Uh, you don't have management talent. You don't have skilled labor who, who are trained to work uh, 
uh, in retail shops or in manufacturing and so on. So nowadays what, what has happened uh, is either agriculture or manufacturing or any service verticals have uh, the, the, the talent or the human resources have to be technologically enabled. So once the technology, uh, they are not technology sensitive, then it becomes the, their uh, uh, efficiency uh, goes down. That is the technology sensitive is use of computers, use of uh, SMSs, use of telephones and, and so on. You should be able to, you should be emails and so on. You should be able to communicate with people and uh, not always uh, looking for face-to-face -face instructions. Of course, social unrest, war, natural calamities, these certainly affect uh, uh, the resource-related risk. Then, of course, the more important thing is, is the raw materials, you know, mines and other raw materials. There is the price increase. For example, oil has increased to a lump, something like $150 uh, a barrel some time ago and it came down to $40 later. And there is also increase in the logistics costs. Logistics costs can increase because of the increase in the price of the trucks, there are taxes uh, and other kinds of things. So diseases in livestock, this is a uh, 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 mad cow disease kind of uh, this one, H1N1, these are all bird flu. These are all the, the diseases that will affect the livestock and of course the contamination contamination of milk, contamination of, of uh, meat uh, and other kinds of things. So basically the, the, it is found that uh, in UK and other places the, uh, the beef is contaminated with horse meat up, up to 20 percent. So basically the, the particularly in the food area and the diseases in livestock and contamination will affect and they could be positively dangerous uh, this. Well, let us look at the uh, risks in the institutions that is the governments and social bodies, regulatory risk, a foreign exchange, foreign exchange uh, fluctuations uh, happen and the foreign exchange fluctuations uh, happen uh, because the US dollar which is the uh, prime uh, currency and there it may have it may go up and down and intellectual property uh, for example the government may say may shut its eyes to theft of intellectual property and uh, there is the customs delays anti-dumping anti-dumping is although it is permissible to import some of the material the at the port it delays or it re refuses the entry of certain goods saying that it is going to affect the local industry. So in case of a financial crisis or when the economy is not doing good, governments can do the anti-dumping. So the supplier who is coming to the, who has come all the way to the port after transiting the ships they will find that the anti-dumping is, uh, is basically law is invoked and they say you get lost, you, we are not going to, uh, going to allow you uh, into your com components into this. Of course, taxes increase, protectionism, these are all the kinds of things that uh, uh, are the regulator risk. There are trade agreements, that is the value added tax, voluntary export restrictions. This yesterday I mentioned this the voluntary export restrictions are the, the company, the country itself says that we are not going to export more than this or we are not going to import more than this particular, this one for this material or this vertical. <coughs> Political government changes, center state relations, environmental issues and corruption. These are basically the, in, in countries like India, United States and other places there is the center government which makes certain rules and there is the state government which, which basically implements some of this. For example, 
if you uh, have a special economic zone, the approval is given by the central government, but the land and other facilities are to be provided by the state government. And similar is the case with uh, with the retail. If there is the case of a retail, uh, the central government gives approval for the foreign direct investment, but the state government has to cooperate in terms of the uh, this one. So basically, if they there are two different parties in center and state, they don't get along. Then you the companies face the heat. And then there are elections in most places in democracies and the government changes every four years or five years. So changes in the government could affect the policies and environmental issues. For example, there are several countries where indus which are industrially forward, they are, they are facing problems of pollution in the water. There are also the, the GHG gases and so on and of course corruption is rampant. In, in most countries, most emerging markets and that basically is an issue. Delays for clearance of projects by the government departments. Well, this is, this is a part of uh, this one. If you have a project where land is involved, in other words, you want to build a factory yeah. and you have to acquire the land from farmers, then it can take a long time for this because the you have to the although the government can give the clearance you have to satisfy the farmers give them the prices probably and they can the, and all this and multiple agencies of the governments are involved and it may be delayed this one and there are labor unions, NGOs and social interest groups. You will find in several places several times that the uh, non-government organizations and social interest groups. Uh, for example, if there is a nuclear power plant that is coming up, then there could be social interest groups who are basically going on strikes and they are objecting to this. And similarly, the uh, non-government organizations. So, you can see that there are several institutions which are so governed come by com uh, the social groups as well as the industry groups as well as uh, the governments that can affect create the risk. So there the delivery infrastructure risk that is the logistics risk, failure of IT infrastructure. This is one thing that people say uh, is, a, is, a, is one of the biggest issues that, uh, that can face because now the hackers are entering into your main computers which control uh, the uh, control the entire supply chain network. Then you can you you can you can be in danger of both theft uh, as well as they can they can they can ruin the entire network so that you cannot function and hardware or software failures viral attacks or natural disasters leading to in a uh, to inability to coordinate operations so if there is if there is an it infrastructure which is controlling very efficiently your supply chain Supposing there is a natural disaster where the power supply goes off and the backups fail, then your IT systems won't operate. That means all your plants, all the manufacturing units, all your service units will be shut down. So these are all the big failures that can occur and one has to be careful. And supply chain visibility failure can happen because if you are using say sensor networks to create visibility, uh, uh, GPS and so on. So there can be failures in those. Inbound outbound logistics failures due to carrier breakdown or the weather problems. Lack of, lack of execution and governance mechanism. Now this is one of the uh, issues that uh, uh, can be corrected but most companies do not have an execution or governance and governance mechanism. In other words, they plan, you know, you, there are lots of packages, ERP and other packages, which will give you the supply chain plans, when to, how much to manufacture, when to pick up, where to deliver, how many trucks and which driver and so on, and when and where to deliver and which route to take and all this is given. but. What happens if something happens and this cannot be executed as given? Who will direct the, the people 
uh, what to do in such situations. So that is the execution here. As uh, I mentioned in the last class, the Penske, uh, which uh, uh, cooperates with collaborates with GenPack to solve the execution problem. So, we have seen that in all the four parameters of our four elements of the supply chain ecosystem, uh, the, uh, uh, the risks of various kinds of things or failures of various kinds of things can happen. Well, whether, when, uh, whether it is man-made or God-made, the, the everything is prone to failure. So, in such a case, I mean, it's not an issue of the failures occur or not, but it it is an issue of how to manage these kind of risks. One, there are two issues. One thing is to stop the risk from happening, and second issue is to manage the risk after it has happened to minimize the the outcome of the risk. So let's look at uh, what is supply chain risk management. Yes. The supply chain supply chain risk management is the aim of supply chain risk management is to reduce the supply chain vulnerability by identification and management of risk within the supply chain and external to it. That's how we defined it. Interorganization coordination of risk is a critical requirement in global supply chains, which are complex independent networks of suppliers, customers, third party service providers, and so on. So this is a thing that we went through and the leaner and more integrated supply chains become, the more likely uncertainties, dynamics and accidents in one link will affect the other. So here, although we have found out that the, the global uh, supply chains, if you want them, make them leaner and more tightly coupled, then it's possible that they are more uh, fragile and are more prone to risk. So, you have to do interorganization coordination of the risk is critical. It's not, it's if you are a manufacturer or a supplier, if you coordinate your own risk, it's not enough. You have to deal with as a supply chain and the entire supply chain need to be coordinated to handle the risk. If, if a supplier is located someplace and he has a disaster and he has some other uh, the, the, a plant in some other place he can supply from there. But all the things need to be coordinated. They, that means there should be another logistics provider, it goes to another country's port and so on. So basically every all the, uh, uh, the route of supply it changes. So one has to coordinate all that. So what are the risks in the in the supply chain. So, if you say risks in product and value chains, So, if you, global supply chains are riskier, riskier than local supply chains. So, let us look at the risks in the product and value chains. The global supply chains are riskier than local supply chains need to deal with different governments on varying infrastructure and intellectual property issues. Some countries are high risk, the risk includes intellectual property infringement supplier and internal product quality failure and security breaches, delay or unavailability of materials from suppliers due to natural disasters, loss of demand due to economic downturn, financial crisis, etc. So, the high performance design makes supply chains very fragile and they get severely affected by disruptions to transport communications and so on. And breaches in partnerships, violation of integrity of cargoes, products, either due to theft or dampering or company proprietary information. So, for example, let us look at what happened in Japan, uh, this one, the March 11, 2011 earthquake. 
tsunami and consequent nuclear crisis in Japan caused shutting supplies from the semiconductors to car plants to manufacturers across the globe. Now, what happened in Japan is there was an earthquake and earthquake has caused tsunami and tsunami has caused uh, the, the electrical power shut down and that also shut down the, the backup batteries. So, the nuclear plant went without power, without control. So, there was a nuclear crisis and this has caused since the power went away all the supplies from these, uh, the suppliers were shut down for uh, for three or four weeks and this location where it happened, it have hosts semiconductor to car parts to manufacture across the globe. So, Boeing faced delays in the delivery of Dreamliner. Dreamliner is the dream uh, aircraft of uh, Boeing and so their parts were manufactured there and General Motors shut down production in the US factories due to shortage of parts and key parts of Apple iPod 2 suddenly became difficult to find. See, but the, the problem here was these companies, Boeing, General Motors and Apple and several others which I did not list uh, here uh, including Toyota and other Japanese companies, they have suppliers in Japan and these are niche suppliers and it is very difficult to replicate what the suppliers are doing. They do not have a duplicate suppliers or somebody the second source where they can source these parts at least at that time. So, given that kind of situation, then the tsunami has basically everybody has shut down. So, you can see the effect of this. Japanese auto companies suffered huge losses. Toyota Japan production in April 2011 fell 74.5 percent and while its global production declined 40 percent, 48 percent. The Honda's production in Japan fell 81 percent in April and the worldwide production declined 52.9 percent. Nissan in Japan production declined 48.7 percent and global production slipped to 42.4 percent. You can see the huge impact that a natural disaster like the earthquake has as an effect on uh, the supply chain. So, basically this is what we call the location risk in the product this one. And there is another one is that in 2011, I am giving you these examples to, to basically illustrate how companies can handle their risk. In 2001, a small fire in Philips semiconductor plant in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the US has disrupted the supply of RFID chips to mobile phone company. So, this uh, they, they supply these RFID chips and uh, then the two companies they are supplying. Nokia reacted with great urgency to ensure that the inventory is available worldwide. So, Nokia what they have done the, uh, the duplicate or second sourcing and they, they got these plants and this. Whereas, Sony Ericsson did not. Ericsson was not able to launch a new high volume product costing an estimated loss of 400 million. So, there are two companies Nokia and Ericsson. Nokia reacted with great urgency that and so that the inventory is available worldwide by sourcing from other sources these R and D chips and whereas, Ericsson did not. Ericsson required some of the losses through insurance, but the premiums have increased sharply. So, basically all these companies are insured. So, you want to transfer the risk from yourself to the insurance companies, but what happens with the risk? The risk is that you will basically pay higher, higher premiums in the future years. And the company lost the market share because it is not able to supply and Ericsson now produces handsets in partnership with Sony. So, Ericsson has lost the business and it has to basically uh, collaborate with Sony to uh, do this. The effect was felt by all members of the network. In other words, in this particular case with Nokia and Ericsson, 
Ericsson did not respond properly, whereas Nokia did, and, uh, and some acted and saved the company, others got affected. So, it sometimes happens that Ericsson has to close its own deals, its own company, and it has to start a new company in partnership with Sony uh, to do this. So, this, this shows you that the, you have to be very vigilant and how to act when a disaster strikes. There is another aspect. There is a Land Rover is a is a is a company which sells uh, Land Rover is a car. It outsources the production of chassis of its Discovery model to a sole supplier UPF Thompson. Now, there there are two things. When you, when you are a manufacturer and when you are outsourcing the production, you can tell the the uh, fellow that he is a sole supplier. That means you are not going to source that product from anybody else. Well, you are going to run the risk of when the sole supplier fails due to some reason, then he cannot supply. Then let us see what happened here in this particular case. UPS Thompson became bankrupt and demanded 46 million dollars from Land Rover to ensure supply or they would not be able to provide the chassis. So, here is the issue that UPS Thompson who is the sole supplier, the, the agreement shows that if the sole supplier has for some reason can is not able to produce, then the Land Rover need to provide the money and make it produce. So, that is what the deal is, that is what the uh, the contract says. So, UPS Thompson, it says that it demanded 46 million dollars from Land, Land Rover to ensure the supply or they would not be provide the chassis and they, they can, they are giving the option, you can source it from somewhere else. But if you want us to do it and because we have the capabilities to do it, but we have become bankrupt. So, we have people, we have the talent, we have the equipment but we need money. If you give 46 million dollars, then we can supply. Then KPMG was the receiver that threatened to haul supply ex exploiting a legal loophole under the sole supplier agreement unless Land Rover made an immediate upfront payment. So, Land Rover has an option. It pays this money and gets the chassis or it can say, you can go elsewhere, I will go, I'll, I'll go to some other supplier. But if it goes to some other supplier, there will be a lot of delay. That is because it has to give the de designs to the find another supplier, give the designs, train them and then get all this done. So, but that takes time. So, because of this agreement, what Land Rover did, it has paid 20 million dollars to Thompson it has guaranteed supply of chassis and protected the company's future. So, this also protected the future of 10,000 jobs of employees of other network members. So, you can see how the small print contracts, things in the contract and when companies fail, how they affect the entire supply chain here. So, Land Rover is another example. So, if you are signing a contract, be careful. So, when your contract manufacturer becomes your competitor, well, so in other words, what happens is you are, you are a manufacturer OEM and you are giving your designs everything to a contract manufacturer and you can happily sit at home and the contract manufacturer manufactures and probably delivers it to the distributors and retailers. And so, since you have basically had the designs. So, you are the owner of the entire thing and it is your brand. So, you can make money, but what happens if the contract manufacturer tries to cheat you or become smart? So, this happened with the PC model Lenovo started as a distributor for IBM and other companies. Now, it formed a joint venture with IBM and soon it will make computers at its own. Now, they are making computers, PCs, laptops and everything as it is sold. But this is, this is the kind of thing that, that you can happen. And IBM created the personal computer industry. The company's name disappeared from PC industry. 
IBM still exists, but it's as a services company, but it couldn't keep the the personal uh, computer industry to itself. That's because one of the prime reasons is outsourcing. Outsourcing the, the windows and other things to other companies, outsourcing the manufacturing to others. So this 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 uns, the smartness didn't exist to keep the this one and IBM got hollowed on the product side, although it does do a lot of strange survey. There is another auto company called Shanghai Automotive Industry Company, Industry Corporation. We started out manufacturing vehicles for Volkswagen and General Motors. Now it's preparing to sell its own cars in China, Europe and North America. So I think the, what happens is the people are smart. Once you start doing things, they learn. They learn while doing things and they have a lot of innovations. They improve the processes. So use there and then they start their own companies to manufacture cars and so on. So that's what, what will happen in this. So your contract manufacturer becomes your competitor. That's a possibility, certainly. So one has to be careful uh, if, you, uh, if you want to protect yourself from this kind of thing. So, the double-edged relationship between OEMs and CMs. So, OEMs can reduce labor costs. Why are you outsourcing? You are outsourcing because you want to reduce the labor costs, free up capital by outsourcing the manufacturing to the contract manufacturer and then concentrate on value-adding activities like R&D, design and marketing. Right? So, this manufacturing is a commodity activity, so you want to outsource it to people. And you concentrate on out uh, on design and marketing, and and sales. So, but then there are other people who are smart, and they basically the OEM retains a CM, or find itself immersed in a melodrama replete with promiscuity. Ambitious CM pursues liaison with other OEMs. In other words, it's just label. The same component, same same uh, laptop, same uh, cell phone can be supplied uh, to others. And infidelity, retailers and distributors shift their business to CM. So the contract manufacturer, instead of buying through uh, Nokia or whatever is the is the brand uh, OEMs, they can buy directly from. Uh, the contract manufacturer with the same brand, which means they save whatever they are paying to the OEM. And then betrayal, CM transmits the IP to the rivals or uses it, uses it for itself. So there are always uh, chances of the OEM getting hollowed out or getting cheated if they are not careful. So we will also look at how to solve this particular problem in this and so on. So there is also a sudden and synchronized drop we have seen in the trade flows by more than the trade flows dropped by more than 20 percent in the 2008 to 2009 quarters. And as I, I told you before that the, the drop is synchronized, synchronized in the sense it happened to all the countries, not one country. And it happened to all the countries for both import and export. So why did this happen? This happened because of the loss of demand in the United States and Europe and that has been felt in the Asia Pacific region by the cancellation of the orders. Because there is inventory for 15, 20 days that's kept and also inventory on the seas, inventory on the roads and the trucks. So people said, all right, let us see by the crisis ends, then we can order again and then they cancel the orders. So once they cancel the orders, there are no export or there are no import. So that has caused the, this particular uh, shutdown. But people blame the, the supply chain for this because the supply chain is connected and it is synchronized. So this, this drop happens is also synchronized because any cancellation happens across the globe from one place to the other. If, you're, if uh, uh, somebody is manufacturing some computer chips somewhere 
and it, it, the order is cancelled then it, it won't send it to the some other place where it is put in a PCB and then uh, then PCB cannot be transmitted to the some other country where they are making PCs and so on. So, this is this is an effect that that happens uh, with this. So, the trade flows got affected and that is called uh, shown as a as a supply chain uh, this one. The synchronization was due to the connectivity of global supply chains that reacted just in time to the collapse in the demand. And they are also uh, act as the risk transmitters and amplifiers. Efficiency contributors of supply chain turned as risk creators, outsourcing. Well, if you are outsourcing, we have seen the risks of outsourcing theft of IP to, uh, to your hollowing out your business and so on. The international, international logistics, well there is the government, international logistics is always involved, it has the governments, it has various kinds of ships and deliveries and so on. So, they, this, they, they, any changes in the government policies, regulations, uh, they will affect this one. And internet credit through LCs, that is the uh, letter of credit, trade and financial flow liberalization, all these things are efficiency contributors and they have turned as risk creators. And 2008 financial crisis and decline in trade that is also called people were saying it is deglobalization. People do not want this globalization because this globalization is creating havoc in their supply chains. 2001, 11, March 11th earthquake, tsunami, nuclear crisis and plant shutdowns in Japan threaten supplies to uh, car parts across the globe. So, if you look at what is the effect of all this, Japan earthquake and tsunami, it costed 210 billion, Thailand floods 30 billion, New Zealand earthquake 20 billion, United States tornadoes 15 billion, Australian floods 7 billion. So, you can say that place of disaster estimated costs of natural disasters in 2011 which will be the costliest year on record. So, in 2011, these are all the kinds of things so that companies have lost because of uh, the natural disasters. So, the supply chains act as risk transmitters and amplifiers. I mean, the big point is if they hold all your supplies, suppliers as well as the manufacturers and the distributors, everybody is either in India or United States or China, they are co-located in one country. Then if a disaster strikes, everybody goes. If on the other hand, if the disaster does not strike that country and it strikes some other country, you are not affected. So, the supply chains acts as risk transmitters and amplifiers. One economy is affected by the other because of the interconnectivity of the supply chain. So, the supply chains, if you want to make them more efficient, make them more connected with more supply chain visibility and so on, then it so happens that you have, uh, you have basically more prone to uh, more risk and so on. So, if you, if you look at uh, uh, this, uh, uh, let us look at the resource related, uh, uh, the rest of the second one. So, in the resource uncertainties are basically employer related, it can be communicable disease, strikes and attrition. You know when the H1N1 struck uh, uh, China, there was, a, there was a lot of problem I think uh, you know in most of these, uh, uh, this one and the flus and others, the number of working hours comes down drastically and the employee productivity comes down because of the disease. The behavioral uncertainty, opportunistic behavior by the CEO, managers and other staff. Well, if they if they uh, want to cheat and then want to get down to this business, then there is the uh, opportunistic behavior. And industry input related such as power shortages, spare parts and availability and so on. And input materials like raw material shortages, quality problems, mad cow disease, chicken flu, oil prices and others and foreign exchange fluctuations. These are all the resource uncertainties that they affect the supply chain. And resource management issues like skill shortage 
it produces services like accounting management consulting advertising venture funding and all that if you if you don't have this then what happens is then the management issues get the skill shortage is one of the issues that is being faced by all countries and that needs to be managed very very carefully because the manpower particularly the human power with managerial capabilities is important to for risk management because during risk it's these things cannot be automated anymore because the things have failed either due to automation or automation like IT and other logistics facilities may have failed and in such a case it's only the human power that becomes uh, the the possible the one that is this one so energy commodity and transportation So, so wreck havoc even on the best run supply chains. Volatile fuel, energy and commodity prices rank as the top three risks. Now you can see the uh, oil price fluctuations every day and also the commodity prices from gold to copper to iron and so on. So they become, they are basically natural resources based and they, they are basically uh, there. Uh, uh, price fluctuations and also it is becoming expensive to mine and also it run transport uh, these and everybody is looking for these resources. So there is lot of demand. So all these things make uh, uh, make uh, the uh, this commodity risk this one. The oil prices have reached highs of 150 barrels reached lows of 34 bar do uh, dollars a barrel and now it is at 100. And many companies question much of their globalization assumptions. Chasing low cost and labor costs in countries like China with little concern about the cost of transporting raw materials, components and finished goods to and from these countries. So, as I said before yesterday in the performance uh, this one I presented the transportation or the transaction costs. The transaction costs are not just the unit costs. It's the cost of transportation, is the cost of taxes and other uh, things including those of the risk and management coordination costs during risk times and so on. So this uh, is it is it worth to chase low cost material labor costs in countries like China or do you want to do things in your own countries? So if you took a look at the transaction costs, the total transaction costs uh, using the ecosystem framework, then you will you will be doing a much more uh, informed decision about uh, sourcing. I think uh, but I'll I'll stop here and then continue uh, later in the next lecture.